And we talked about this, I think, in another video at one point, maybe a thousand years ago. Number one, um, <laughs> when it comes to the, oh, shoot, okay, is this too bright? Did I do it wrong? Hi, my name is Father Mike Schmitz, and this is Ascension Presents. So I think I might have mentioned this a couple times. Maybe I haven't, but there's this program called Renewed and Received that's put out by Ascension. It's basically First Reconciliation Prep and First Holy Communion Prep. It's for kids to, who are going through this, but also it's for parents. A lot of times people look back on their those early years and they say like, I kind of didn't get it. Maybe I didn't care at the time. Maybe I wasn't paying attention. Maybe I was sick that day. I don't know the importance of the Eucharist. I don't know the importance of confession. In fact, one of the big questions comes up, even if someone was there, they, they showed up for class and they maybe even cared, is like, I don't get why I have to go to a priest for confession. Why do I have to? Why do we have to go to a priest for confession? And I'm like, that's a great question. I would say this. I would say that we recognize that God has bound himself to his sacraments, which means that whenever we celebrate the sacraments, he's there, he's active, he's present and he's doing stuff, right? So whenever God, we have the sacraments, God shows up. He has bound himself to his sacraments. At the same time, we know that God is not bound by his sacraments. Meaning, if you ask the question, can God save outside of baptism? The answer is yes, because God is has bound himself to his sacraments, but he's not bound by his sacraments. Can Jesus forgive outside of confession? Yes, because Jesus, God has bound himself to his sacraments, but he's not bound by his sacraments. So if you want to get nitpicky right away, is it possible for Jesus to forgive our sins outside of confession? And the answer is yes. Okay, so get that out there. At the same time, that's extraordinary. What is sin? Sin is saying, God, I know what you want. I don't care. I want what I want. Right, so sin is, the very kernel of sin, the very nature of sin is, God, I know what you want. I don't care, I want what I want. So think about that in terms of reconciliation. We have this, we have us telling God, God, I know what you want. You established the sacrament of reconciliation for me to receive your mercy, receive your reconciliation and your restoration. I don't want that, I want the other thing. Like I want the extraordinary way. See, see how that's not really, it's kind of like trying to come back without really coming back. So that's kind of important. Pay attention to that one. I just, I, sorry, my invitation. Pay attention to that one. I want to go back even further though. So we know this, get out right out, the, right out of the gate. God has bound himself to his sacraments. He's not bound by his sacraments. But why do I have to go to confession for forgiveness? Let's take it even, even further and ask the question, how is forgiveness even a possibility? And let's go even, even further. How is forgiveness even a good thing? You know, how, why is mercy even considered a virtue? I don't know if you've studied a much history, but a lot of the pre-Christian cultures and pre-Christian peoples and, and worldviews, they didn't consider mercy to be a virtue. Forgiveness was not considered to be a good thing. Mercy demonstrated that you were weak. Forgiveness was for fools. I mean, truly, to be able to not just forgive maybe someone close to you, like maybe I have to forgive my brother or I have to forgive my child or whatever that thing is, a person in my clan, person in my tribe. But to forgive someone just because they asked or to forgive someone to release them from their debt, that was not by and large ever considered a virtue. By and large, it was not considered a virtue in pre-Christian cultures and among pre-Christian people. It was actually the introduction of Judeo-Christianity into this world where forgiveness and mercy became elevated to this height, right? Remember, because we talked about this so many times. In the Old Testament with the Jewish people, God establishes that he is just. Because even that, like the question is, it's, this world seems kind of arbitrary. It's, this world seems like sometimes things go well, sometimes things don't go well, and God reveals himself like, no, 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 actually, I'm good. And what that means is I'm just, that, uh, that I'm fair, that I'm not indiscriminate, that I'm not arbitrary but he's just. So God reveals that he's just. In the New Testament, God reveals that he's not, in, also in the Old Testament, but fully reveals in the New Testament that as a just and completely good and fair God, he also is merciful. And that's, that's what we need both of those. As Christians, we need both justice and mercy. We've talked about that so many times. And then there's this next step then. As the Christianity goes out into the world, we started presenting to the world this truth that God is just and God is merciful. And then the world began embracing this truth that mercy is a good thing, that mercy is a virtue, that mercy in many ways is even higher than justice. Justice is still good, but mercy even trumps justice in a remarkable, remarkable way. So let's, let's just pause on the fact that Jesus, 
in his work, in God revealing himself to the world, has revealed not only justice, has revealed mercy, and revealed mercy as a good thing, and next thing's crazy, as a possibility, that we could receive mercy. Jesus doesn't just make it a good thing, he makes it a possibility, and then, of course, Jesus makes it a reality, that God makes mercy a reality. And how does he do this? As God, he could have done it in any way he wanted. He could just say, I declare this whole world saved. I, I, I declare you all forgiven. But in many ways, that wouldn't be just, right? Because justice is still real. How does God make mercy possible? Is he takes on himself the consequences of all of our sins. He takes on himself and he bears the weight. He bears the consequences of all of the sins of the world. And not just the sins of the world, but my sins. And he bore to the very end every consequence of every sin that has ever, will ever, is ever, or will ever happen. Jesus bore that weight. And because he did that, he made mercy a possibility. He made mercy a reality. And then he goes on to say in John chapter 20, after he rises from the dead on Easter Sunday, he says to his disciples, as the Father sent me, so now I send you, right? Father sent him to do what? To restore, to reconcile, to bring forgiveness to the world. As the Father sent me, so now I send you. And he breathed on the apostles and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Those whose sins you forgive are forgiven them. Those sins you hold bound are held bound from the very beginning, the very first day after the, of the resurrection. The apostles received this ability to reconcile people to the Father. They received this ability to participate in the ministry of Jesus, in the ministry of reconciliation of Jesus. And Jesus made it in that, that moment absolutely clear that these apostles are now the new priests. Because in the Old Covenant, the, the ministry of reconciliation was through the Old Testament priesthood. You see this in the Gospels too, right? You have the, the lepers. And Jesus heals the lepers and says, go show yourself to the priests and that will be enough for them. Why? Because the priests will then receive them back into the community. Now, not that leprosy was, was sin, but that made them unclean. And so how do you get received back in? How do you get reconciled to the community? How do you get restored to the community? Through the ministry of the priests. And Jesus in John chapter 20, he's establishing that these apostles now, they are now the New Testament priests who minister reconciliation and restoration back into the body of Christ, back into the family of God. Jesus has given us this great sacrament to use. So why do I have to go to confession? Well, A, mercy is a good thing because of Jesus. It's a possibility because of Jesus, because of Jesus, and it's a reality because of Jesus. He can do it any way he wants, right? He can forgive us outside of confession if he wants, but the way he's asked us to be reconciled, the way he's asked us to experience his forgiveness, the way he's asked us to be restored, is through confession. This is not meant to be a burden. This is a gift. That's, that's it. It's, it's not a burden. It's a gift. It's a gift of God's love. The love that we deserve the least but need the most. That's mercy. The love we deserve the least but need the most and it comes to us in confession. And I, as I said, I, that's not a burden. That is a gift. So, what's holding you back from letting the Lord love you in this way? What's holding you back from letting the Lord restore you and reconcile you to himself through the ministry of the priests as he intended in John chapter 20 and beyond? Anyways, from all of us here to Sense Presents, my name is Father Mike. God bless. People's pre Christian cultures, pre, pre confession. If you. Wait. All right, all right. Why do I always have to say that? I don't know why. Okay.